All right. Well, I just wanted to welcome everyone to the second and concluding Cosmo Local portion of the Origins of Cosmo Local Gathering, Gepser Conference, the 50th annual conference. Um, the afternoon sessions now commence. Uh, today, we've only got one presentation, but it's from Sam Hins. Um, and Sam, I, I don't know if I've been pronouncing your last name correctly, Him, Hins? Hines? It's actually Hines. Hines. Okay, I apologize mm -hmm. for that. Well, Sam Hines is here. And um, the, the only thing I got from, from Sam when we were getting set up was the was the title and the title sounded absolutely marvelous and poetic and i was immediately intrigued uh communal reverie early gropings toward imaginal a perspectivity through interactive imagination so first of all imaginal a perspectivity um so i've been looking forward to this uh sam and uh just as a brief note as well as we conclude sam's portion we'll go about an hour uh, we'll, we'll be opening up to the unthinkable present, concluding conversation dialogue. Everyone is welcome to share their reflections and, and comments and integrations on, on the conference proceedings as they have generally been unfolding. So Sam, I want to welcome you and feel free to take the floor and, and take us into uh, the imaginal. Great, thank you, Jeremy. And I just want to thank you for hosting this um, and for the opportunity. Um, can I get a share a screen sharing here? I'll bring us into a little presentation that I put together. There we go. There you go. Okay. Wonderful. So the title of this talk uh, is actually the, the working title of my dissertation at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Uh, communal reverie, early gropings toward imaginal a perspectivity through interactive imagination. I'll let all of you decide how, how grandiose that title might be um, on the other side of this. Um, so communal reverie is the provisional name for a practice I've been experimenting with with a couple friends, Cristiano and Cheryl, who uh, I didn't expect to both be here, but they are, which is great. And I'll have more to, uh, to say about them uh, shortly. Um, and so I'm just going to get right into uh, and this artwork here on the cover. Um, Cheryl illustrated this uh, solar eclipse, which I used as a symbol to frame this practice to them. And I'll have more to say about that as well. Um, so first off, I'll just begin by saying that communal reverie might be regarded as an experiment in interanimating the practices and principles of collective presencing and active imagination. Um, so to lay this out, I'll have to go into both of those practices first. So collective presencing uh, comes from the work of Rhea Bach. She wrote the book on it. Um, the subtitle of the book is An Emerging Human Capacity. So she's trying to articulate something that she feels is coming online right now. And in the book, she outlines how collective presencing grew out of a, a gathering called Women Moving the Edge. Um, so it was a group of women that met over a number of years recurringly. Um, and this actually stemmed from another group that Rhea was invited to by a friend of hers, Vin Foltoff, uh, called Moving the Edge of Collective Intelligence. And the way that Finn framed this group was that this group was going to be attempting to um, find what he called the magic in the middle. And Rhea resonated with this description. She felt she already had some recognition of what he was aiming at, um, which seems to be this sort of um, resonant flow of participatory and deeply embodied uh, information um, and uh, kind of clarity that can run through a group that convenes in deep co-presence with each other. Um, so Rhea went and attended that group with some friends, found that that magic in the middle did emerge for just a brief moment, but felt it didn't quite coalesce in the way that she was hoping. Um, and she and some friends felt that it was just a little bit too cerebral most of the time in the group and that that really that state is really achieved through deep embodiment. So um, Rhea and a friend Judy Wallace convened Women Moving the Edge. Um, now, it's also worth noting that um, Otto Scharmer in his work with uh, Theory U and Presencing is also very influential uh, for Rhea's work and just for what is called We Space more broadly. You know, the, the work of Olin Gunlogson, Thomas Hubel, um, I know Ken Wilbur uh, around WeSpace has done interviews with Otto Schirmer as well. 
Um, Sharmer did an interview in the early 2000s with another group of women. Uh, they called themselves the Circle of Seven. Um, now this was in, and Sharmer said that he feels that this is the heart of his book on Theory U, which is the foundation of awareness-based systems change. Um, the Circle of Seven was a group of six women who met recurringly. The reason that they called themselves the Circle of Seven is because they felt that under the right conditions, they'd feel the presence of something that they came to call the circle being. And it was almost as if another presence that was very palpable um, it began to emerge between them, resonates with this magic in the middle that Finn Voltoft was trying to point to as well. Right, so there's this stream of influence. Uh, Rhea even draws some quotes from the Circle of Seven interview in, in her book. So I wanna to point to a few members of um, Women Moving the Edge here. We have Rhea on the left with Collective Presencing. On the right, uh, Sarah Whiteley, um, she was also a mem uh, part of that original group and went on to uh, work with a practice that she's presently doing called Collective Alchemy, which is similar to Collective Presencing, but um, draws on metaphors from the Hermetic alchemical tradition and weaves in archetypes as well by working with tarot cards. Uh, and then Helen, who co-authored the original uh, articles uh, in Cosmos Quarterly, I think in like 2012 on Collective Presencing with Rhea, um, and also helped Sarah a lot and is really involved in collective alchemy. Um, so these are like a few elders um, of this practice uh, in my mind. Um, and another, here I got to actually minimize something here so I can read a little more clearly. There we go. Um, so both collective presencing and collective alchemy also very self-consciously situate themselves in relation to Gebzer. So I'm going to read a, a, a phrase from Rhea here out of the collective presencing book. She writes that the practice that we came to call collective presencing seems to tell us something about evolution itself, about a human capacity beginning to emerge, and about the new paradigm that we see and feel unfolding through us. The framework I found that best fit our experiences was Jean Gebser's description of the mutation of consciousness written halfway through the previous century. This is important. Note that she's, she's coming to Gebser in light of finding that what he's describing fits the experiences they're having in these groups, right? Um, and then likewise, Sarah in her, what she calls a we thesis uh, based on collective alchemy uh, in recognition that she feels that everything that came through her thesis is really attributable to the field of practice itself. Um, she writes, collective alchemy is an evolutionary offshoot of the ancient practice of alchemy that can accelerate the evolution of human consciousness. It provides a bridge from the mental rational consciousness predominant in the Western world to the newly emerging integral consciousness described by Jean Gebzer. Um, very central to collective presencing and, and Rhea's reflections on the practice is this idea of the group field, right? The way Rhea writes about this, she says, here we use the notion group field to denote the inner dimension that seems to be present in any kind of group to which our Western world pays scant attention. There are always subtle energies present that we can learn to detect, trust, amplify, and nurture. Rhea calls this subtle sensing, and it's very central to the practice of collective presencing. So there, there can be the, the emergence of this magic in the middle, but it's a capacity that we can uh, practice and build um, competency in through this subtle sensing. And it's largely about being very embodied to, to both the gross body and beyond uh, the subtle body. You could say. Um, so I want to reflect on different conceptions regarding this idea of coherence. Um, this means different things in different contexts, but I mean this um, this kind of group field resonance that Rhea is pointing towards. And there's there are a lot of different understandings in the integral world around what's going on here. And I'm going to start with Ken Wilbur, because uh, in his chapter on the um, kind of collection of essays published by Integral Publishing House called Cohering the Integral We Space, he is framing this coherence as a manifestation of higher, what, what, what he frames as the, the second, tier, second tier stages of development, which he, he regards as um, exemplifying a kind of increased interpersonal sensitivity. And through that interpersonal set sensitivity, there's an affordance for actually elevated state experiences that he sees as reaching toward the non-dual. Um, so this non-dual has this one mind quality and 
once that state starts to be reached, he says it's as if there is a, um, a singular mind that's emerging between the group, right? What, what the circle of seven might have called this, this circle being. Ken Wilber is very emphatic to emphasize, uh, to, to make clear that um, there's no dominant, what Whitehead would call like a dominant monad in the group. It just feels as if there's a oneness there. It's also important to acknowledge that in this essay, Wilbur draws on Gebser and frames Gebser's structures in terms of a developmental sequence, uh, despite the fact that Gebser goes to great pains to, uh, to demonstrate that his, what he's calling the structures of consciousness are not de developmental. There's not a linear or progressive thing going on um, with what he's, he's articulating. So what would Gebser um, maybe have to contribute to this whole idea of coherence? I'm going to uh, read a section from the ever-present origin where he's talking about uh, a quality endemic to the magic structure of consciousness. So Gebser writes, communication between members of the group ego, the we, does not as yet require language, but occurs to a certain extent subcutaneously or telepathically. The egolessness of the individual who is not yet an individual demands participation and communication on the basis of the collective and vital intentions. The inseparable bonds of the clan are the dominant principle. So there's a sense that there's this, this coherence that's actually an endemic part of the magic structure of consciousness itself, right? Now, if what Rhea is gesturing towards that what happens in these group practices is a step toward the integral consciousness, then we might regard this sense of coherence as the rendering present of this magical uh, group ego um, dwelling alongside the mental uh, centrated ego consciousness in a kind of um, processual dynamic, right? This is in, in rendered like phenomenologically to consciousness. So this would be an example of what Gebser calls synairesis. Um, Benita Roy's uh, reflections um, on coherence seem to accord with this interpretation uh, to some extent, at least. Um, in an interview that she gave uh, for Rebel Wisdom, she said, uh, even though we have this collective intelligence, we might say that we don't feel particularly connected in terms of relationally connected or intimately connected or have a lot of affection for each other. So we have this collective intelligence, but we're certainly missing something that perhaps we had in pre-modern times. Some of these practices are helping us reclaim something that we had long ago. So that's still not an emergent human capacity, but I do think that somehow the emergent capacity and reclaiming this earlier prior capacity, that they're dependent upon each other. So Benita's kind of saying it's both, right? That there is a, a step forward that what Rhea's framing as an emerging capacity is going on, but it's dependent on the uh, retrieval into presence of something that actually we've lost touch with. Um, and for Benita, it's very important that, um, uh, that everybody present in the group it is actually individuated to a certain degree, at least to achieve what she's calling collective insight, right? That yes, we, we resonate in this, this kind of we space, but to the extent that everyone is sufficiently individuated to really contribute their unique perspective to the group, that's where a lot of the kind of emergent magic uh, can happen. And the late great Ir William Irwin Thompson in Darkness and Scattered Light wrote something very much to this effect. He wrote that, in a healthier collective consciousness, the individual is aware of the presence of the group mind, but his own integrity is not crushed by it. Um, also, interestingly, Otto Scharmer, in an interview on the Stoa last December, um, he, he brought in this term transubjectivity as opposed to intersubjectivity. Um, it, the, the reason he was framing this is that he felt that this, this notion of intersubjectivity wasn't quite satisfying, that what emerges in these deep uh, states of coherence um, in these we space groups it, it seems to exceed what could be intelligible just in terms of an interaction of bounded subjects, right? Even limited to just the human subjects that are uh, involved, that there's a coming to presence of something m much larger that transgresses the whole idea of the, of the bounded subject altogether. Um, and finally, I just wanna point to what uh, Miriam and Stefan Martineau um, suggest as an, as an aspect of the conditions that give rise to this uh, state of coherence. Um, and they talk about grace being very important. Um, 
this is really in accordance with what Gebser is gesturing towards when he is saying that the realization of the integral is not a mere matter of volition. You know, we can't simply make it happen. We need to be in a uh, matrix of participation with a deeper effectivity, right? One that we can't just will into being the effectivity of origin needs to be present, right? So, it's, so there does seem to be this element of, of grace, something else that's present when these states are achieved. Okay, so I'm gonna to move to active imagination here. Um, and I'll just start with something that Jung wrote. In sleep, fantasy takes the form of dreams, but in waking life too, we continue to dream below the threshold of consciousness. And I'll add what Anthony Stevens, a Jungian analyst wrote. He said, active imagination requires a state of reverie, halfway between sleep and waking. So. What Jung was trying to um, get at, he introduced this term active imagination to signify um, a technique where there's a relaxation of consciousness. And he would always draw on this phrase by Pierre Genet, a basement du niveau mental. It's this relaxation of the kind of directed um, volitional activity of the mind to let that, um, that fantasy activity, that image making activity below that's ordinarily latent below the threshold of consciousness to uh, sufficiently uh, relax to allow that to um, become present uh, on the stage of awareness. Very simple way of framing it. Um, now I want to introduce the, the term imaginal here. Um, this is a term that was introduced by Henry Corban in a lecture that he gave back in the 60s. Um, he introduced this term imaginal to distinguish from the English term imaginary, right? So he wrote, my intention in proposing the two Latin words mundus imaginalis as a title for this paper was to circumscribe a very precise order of reality, which corresponds to a precise mode of perception. So he's granting um, ontological, um, uh, ontological reality to this this realm of the imaginal, he's saying that there's a precise mode of perception required to access it. What is this mode of perception? He writes, the organ which perceives the mundus imaginalis or imaginal is imaginative consciousness, cognitive imagination. And then he continues, active imagination is the mirror par excellence, the epiphanic place for the images of the archetypal world. A lot of important stuff here. Okay, so he's, he's saying that the imaginal is pointing to a plane of existent phenomena apprehended through the organ of the imagination, right, that corresponds to what the uh, alchemist Paracelsus calls imaginatio vera. This is like true imagination, as opposed to what he would have called the madman's cornerstone or what Coleridge would call fancy. And this has to do more with the capacity of the imagination to just fabricate unreality. That's what the typical Western mode would conceive of all imagination being, but there's a distinction being drawn here. Um, interestingly, uh, Tom Cheatham points this out that it's not quite clear where the term active imagination was introduced for Corban because he was clearly influenced by Jung. He cited him often, um, but the first time he introduces the term active imagination, it was in translation of a term by the Persian mystic Suharwadi, and uh, that term was takhayul. Um, it's not clear whether that was Corban's own way of rendering that translation into English or whether he wanted explicitly to draw a link with Jung's idea. Um, it's, it's ambiguous. Um, finally, uh, Corban's term mundus archetypus as a synonym for mundus imaginalis um, is, is showing that this, this plane of the imaginal is populated with archetypal images. It's symbolic, it's metaphorical, it's poetic, it's archetypal in nature. And I'm going to share a couple of quotes here by Corban and Jung um, to kind of get at the nature of this imaginal plane. Uh, Corban writes, the symbol announces a plane of consciousness distinct from rational evidence. It is a cipher of a mystery, the only means of saying something that cannot be apprehended in any other way. A symbol is never explained once and for all, but must be deciphered over and over again, all right? So there's, there's an activity going on here with something that's fathomless. We're, we're engaged in an infinite hermeneutic with, with the imaginal, with these symbols that we apprehend through the imagination. Um, here's a quote from Jung on dreams, but this applies equally to the content that comes up through active imagination. Jung writes, I know that if we meditate on a dream sufficiently long and thoroughly, if we carry it around with us and turn it over and over, something almost always comes of it. 
This something is not, of course, a scientific result to be boasted about or rationalized, but it is an important practical hint which shows what the unconscious is aiming at. This is Jung um, uh, essentially suggesting that there's an aim here, that, there, that when we metabolize these images, when we turn them over, that there is what he calls the unconscious has a kind of uh, uh, an aim to it. And we're participating and staying on track with that aim when we contemplate these images or when we work with them. Um, and that aim has to do with individuation. Um, very important for both Corban and Jung, though they frame it differently. So for Jung, individuation is, is framed in, in psychological terms and uh, active imagination will essentially lead to um, making contact with personifications of the unconscious um, that will first lead to greater contact with and the possibility of assimilation of those unconscious aspects of the personality um, that can then be uh, kind of brought into the purview of the conscious ego. But eventually it becomes a means for just ongoing uh, kind of dialogical relationship with the unconscious personified. And that will afford a greater kind of balance and equilibrium in the psyche and ultimately the capacity to uh, stay on track with the aim of what Jung calls the capital S self or the total psyche, that there is a telos that we're participating in. And it's a way to honor that and uh, feed staying on track with that. For Corban, it's much more explicitly uh, theological. Corban's idea of the imaginal is linked with uh, like Persian Neoplatonism. Um, and so in, in this case, the idea is that um, what comes through active imagination are theophanies. They're images of, of a divine um, source, a divine origin. And to tend to these images, to nourish them, to work with them, um, is a way of feeding the process whereby the suprapersonal image of divine origin that is ours to incarnate in the world um, is, is readily brought into realization, that we feed the process of becoming what these theophanies are luring us to become. And eros, um, or better said, pothos, which is like the divine inflection of erotic longing, is the fuel that keeps this process uh, going. Okay, now I'm, I want to uh, explore some ideas about imaginal time and imaginal causality here. I'm going to start with Jung. Um, this is from seminars that he gave on uh, children's dreams in the late 30s and into 1940. So, and this is where we start getting into temporics. Because dreams enter into consciousness one after the other, we conceive of them uh, with the help of the temporal category, and we cannot relate them to one another in a causal way, um, or we, we tend to relate them in a causal way. Um, it can't be excluded, however, that the true order of the first dream enters into consciousness only much later. This seemingly chronological series, as it were, is not the true series. If we conceive of it in this way, we make a conception to our concept of time. So he's saying that and he's, he's largely pointing to children's dreams here, um, that there's often a series of dreams that comes through early in life. And it seems like there's a temporal sequence to them. We might relate to them causally, but he's saying there's a different true order here. And what is that true order? He's saying the actual arrangement of dreams is a radial one. The dreams emanate from a center and are only later subjected to the influence of our time. So in the final analysis, they're arranged around a center of meaning. Right now, even more interestingly, Jung saw that in early childhood dreams, there seems to be a prefiguration metaphorically or mythically of the dominant themes of the individual life. So it's as though in the twilight of the dawn, when the ego is just beginning to consolidate, there are these emanations from, he would call it the unconscious, you can call it the imaginal, um, that where there's, the, there's such a fullness of time that so much of the individual's uh, the dramatic arc of the individual's life is already anticipated. Um, now let's see what Cynthia Bergeau, the Christian uh, contemplative and mystic has to say on this idea of imaginal causality. This all comes from her book, The Eye of the Heart. And she writes so well and so beautifully about this. So I'm gonna quote her at length. Um, so she describes that there is a non-linearity to the, the causal logic of the imaginal. And there are these synchronic happening simultaneously or diachronic across different times resonance between corresponding patterns. She writes, 
Because of this fundamentally spatial, as opposed to linear, aspect of imaginal causality, the bits and pieces inside the frame do not usually hook up in a linear fashion. More often, they appear as simultaneous, overlapping resonances or patterns, caught by the heart rather than the mind, speaking the language of resonance or correspondences, as the poet Baudelaire called them, announcing their logic by the strength of the connectivity they establish between them. Um, so it's, it's about correspondences. It's about likeness, resonance of common meaning when it comes to the imaginal. She's also emphasizing, and this is important, that there's an, amine, uh, an emergent meaning that's arising through the interplay of the components. So there's something that's arising in the relationships between these imaginal patterns. In imaginal causality, the meaning is generated in the richness of the interplay. One can speak properly about a tapestry of meaning, or in a scientific metaphor, one can say that the meaning is an emergent property of the whole. It doesn't lie in any single part, no matter how powerfully configured, but in the way the bits and pieces speak to each other, calling each other into resonance. It's detected in the subtlety of the weave and in the energy released, in the interplay among the various strands. From the center, things flow out and towards each other, creating combinations, sometimes surprising, but recognized by the heart as meaningfully congruent. The themes, words, symbols, and images all sound together to reveal hitherto unsuspected dimensions of depth, meaning, and beauty. The validating sense is one of coherence and richly patterned meaning. So this is about meaning, this is about image, it's about resonance, and it doesn't uh, really hang, it, it gets us into a different experience of time um, that doesn't quite hang with the, with the linear experience of the mental consciousness. And this is very important. Uh, Burgeau's suggesting there's actually an interplay between these time forms when we're engaging with the imaginal, right? There's an interplay between what Gebser would frame as li uh, linear mythic temporality, mythic cyclical temporicity, and this archaic and magic kind of timelessness. Right? So one of the most important strands of the interplay lies in the counterpoint between the two different kinds of causality themselves, linear and synchronous. It is completely necessary intertwining. Otherwise, that great imaginal panorama simply floats out there with nothing to ground it in the marrow of our earthly lives, to feed it with the raw material for the continuous alchemy between the realms, right? So Bourgeau is thinking with Gurdjieff here, and he has this notion of reciprocal feeding. So it's, it's essentially to say that, that these realms, through imaginal practice, these realms intermingle and, and mutually affect one another, and that there's something very valuable about this, there's an alchemy that goes on. Once you start getting um, uh, involved with the imaginal, the imaginal starts getting involved with you. Um, finally, uh, she points to chiasm, um, which I, like a chiastic structure is a literary device that has a kind of concentric organization around a core, like a center. An example would be like something that has the structure of A, B, C, C, B, A. And this is in her book. She's drawing from the work of Bruno Barnhart who's trying to organize the Gospel of John in this chiastic form. And so you can see it kind of all organizes concentrically around the center. So we have the same radial organization that Jung is also gesturing towards. Um, one last part, and this is extremely crucial. Uh, Rob Berbea, who passed away last year, but before he did, left us with this really um, original and incredibly beautiful teaching that he calls the soul-making dharma. Um, this question of how we distinguish between the imaginary and the imaginal is a really rich question, um, not easy to get to the bottom of, but he has one very um, kind of practical way of uh, gauging when it is that we're actually making legitimate contact with like the imaginal realm. And what he's saying is that um, he, he's using the term samadhi, which he's framing here as like awareness of and sensitivity to the energy body. Um, this is what affords contact with the imaginal. So if, you, if you're if you tuned into the subtle energy body and you can feel where within the subtle energy body these images are arising from, that's an indication for Berbea that you're, that you're close to the imaginal here. Now, because subtle sensing is so central to collective presencing or these presencing practices more general, um, not only to participate in the practice, but it seems like the field itself um, supports the subtle sensing. So it, it seems like presencing practice is actually a, a really um, helpful arena for supporting imaginal revelation. 
I want to turn toward Gebser here because he has some interesting things to say about the ontological status of the archetype. And this is coming in part two of the ever present origin where he's looking at manifestations of the ape perspectival world. This is from the section of psychology on psychology. And he really focuses on Jung here and he zeroes in on the archetype as an ape perspectival um, manifestation. So this is what Gebser writes. The archetypes themselves are the archetypical structures. Uh, and the archetypical structures are eternally present. This means that they are time free. They are such that although lacking a material existence, they preform the psyche. This means that they are not only immaterial as the psychic is in and of itself, but they're a material. They underlie and preform the psyche a chronically and a materially. Moreover, to the intellect, they are unknown and inexpressible. That is, they are not merely irrational, but irrational insofar as their incomprehensibility and inconceivability do not prevent us from raising them into perceptibility. So again, archetypes, symbols, the imaginal it has this fathomless quality. It just exceeds our ability to rationally uh, comprehend it in its totality. No, nonetheless, we can know it somehow. We can recognize it somehow. And that these are time free. It means that they belong to no single structure of consciousness. They belong to the whole. They permeate the whole. So I would say that this implies that archetypes latently permeate the dreamless sleep of the archaic structure. They actively cohere the timeless entangled vital nexus of the magic. They diffract imagistically into the cycles, pantheons, and storied patterns of the mythic. And finally, they latently exude effects upon the mental, generally by way of unconsciously literalized mythic fantasies. This is what, what Hillman's work is pointing to, William Roman Thompson does a lot of work on the ways that these, these mythic patterns are projected onto the world and taken literally. Um, and then also occasional eruptions of magic synchronicities. I put synchronicities in quotes because synchronicity isn't a noun. Um, Jung frames it as an abiding principle. It's like kairos, right? That there's a, a, a formal quality and qualitative dimension of time. But you know, generally people, what, what the mental does with time is it partitions like events and nounifies them. And when these eruptions of that correspondence kind of break through suddenly for the mental consciousness, people say like, I just experienced a crazy synchronicity. Um, but it's, it's an ongoing thing. It's ever present. Um, so I'd say that in some, Gebser's statement here implies that archety archetypes constitute the irrational and time-free primordial forms through which the effectivity or of origin emanates integrally throughout the whole. They permeate all throughout the fully present and fully transparent whole and the hyperwakeful clarity of the integral structure. And I'll say further that if we take this reading of Gebser's statement about archetypes, we might consider that imaginal practice constitutes a means of opening to a more deeply participatory relationship with the effectuality of origin as it richly echoes and reverber reverberates through archetypal images and patterns, right? I think that this has resonance with what Owen Barfield is trying to gesture towards with this idea of, of final participation, right? That originally humanity was in a, a thoroughly archetypally saturated matrix. And with the coming online of the ego, right? What Gebser would call the, the mental structure of consciousness, that archetypal dimension was eclipsed. It, it fell out of consciousness. Now, uh, Barfield is saying that with this final participation, as he calls it, and he uses a strange term here, he says that humanity stands in a directionally creator relation with, um, with that original nexus. The, what I take that to mean, at least, is that, again, what Gebser says, right, distanciation um, is the necessary precondition for the awakening of consciousness. That process allow, uh, kind of affords the capacity for humanity to now have more creative poetic license with the mythopoetic constraint of the archetypes, but there's still in, there's infinite possibility within archetypes. There's infinite creative potential, and we can actually participate more fully um, in that once, once consciousness has, has awakened to itself. Um, if there were a guiding question of communal, for communal reverie, um, at least in my mind, it, it would probably be something like this. What becomes possible when we achieve coherence in small groups, as in collective presencing, while aiming not just to speak to and from the middle, but to imagine together from the field, that is to actively imagine communally from the resonant space of coherence that arises between us. Um, so I've been doing this practice since about January and, and 
we have Christiana Siri and Cheryl Shu here who have been my co revericians co-creators really. Um, incidentally, they're both involved. They both have a background in, in systems uh, or like a design and like systems design. They've both done really interesting work in their own kind of local areas. Cristiano is living in uh, Genoa, uh, Italy, Cheryl um, in Toronto, uh, Canada. And this practice would not have taken the form it did without them. It was completely emergent. So much of what took form was the result of like their bold leaps and their contributions. Um, and so this is this is everything that's coming forward here is really a product of like just what's emerged between the three of us experimenting and playing together. Um, so I'm going to go into like what the initial provisional structure of communal reverie has been. It's there are three types of sessions. Um, lunar sessions, solar sessions, and what we came to call corridor sessions, which is symbolized by the eclipse. So I want to say that in, in, in actually, I want to frame this a little bit more before I jump into it. Like in collective presencing, the way it works is that there's a talking piece. We put the talking piece in the center. We drop in together into our bodies, into presence. We sense into the field. And then when something's ready to come through, someone takes the talking piece, offers something in, and we just take up the talking piece when we're ready, right? And just let it unfold from there. So in lunar sessions, there's an emphasis on staying with the imagery that's sourced from the field. So we're actively imagining from the field. Um, this means that we lay aside the conceptual and prosaic and discursive processes of mental consciousness for the duration generally of the lunar session. Um, it proceeds by way of the talking piece. And the, the way it works is that you, this doesn't happen this way every time, but most generally the first person who puts an image or makes contact with an image and shares it, we tend to continue sensing into that image and we just gradually um, elaborate it, disclose it fully, slowly open up this imaginal realm together um, just by making our contributions, co-sensing into this imaginal space using the talking piece. And then we have solar sessions, right? Now this tends to emphasize, this now emphasizes the prosaic and discursive processes of mental consciousness while still sourcing from the field, but we might reflect on what came up before or we just give more, um, more space to the mental consciousness to come in and have its peace. It doesn't mean that we um, negate everything from the lunar. Uh, we also let that in, but the solar really has free play here. It's not being laid aside. Now these corridor or eclipse sessions, right? This aims for a fluid intermingling of the of the lunar and social, which are the lunar and solar. We try to render them all equipresent, right? Not really privileging any of them and just seeing what comes up in this fluidity. Um, and the eclipse as the marriage of sun and moon can become a symbol of diaphaneity here, right? Because we can take the sun as a symbol, not only for the, for the ego and for the mental structure of consciousness, right? This, um, this sense of being a centrated, uh, autonomous and willful ego, right? But it's also a symbol then for that structure of consciousness that rendered the other structures of consciousness latent, right? So the lunar then becomes a symbol for the depths becomes a symbol for the unconscious in the Jungian sense. And it becomes a, a symbol for the, um, the structures of consciousness that came alive prior to the mental, right? And one other good reason why the eclipse is such a, a fitting symbol, right? The first time I ever saw a solar eclipse was in 2017. And it's, it's the sun and moon, you know, coming together in this marriage. But as soon as the eclipse went total, um, Mercury, Venus, and Mars were in the sky. Um, they were not visible during the day. As soon as the eclipse went total, the sky was rendered transparent. These celestial bodies, these gods, which were present but latent, now shined through transparently in the middle of the day, right? It's a great, uh, just a great, almost like true metaphor, as Barf Barfield would say, for uh, this, this quality of diaphaneity. So one round of communal reverie usually looks something like this. We'll have a, a lunar session, We'll be focusing on the imaginal, uh, the solar session. We'll just kind of, you know, bring a little bit more mental stuff online. We'll do that one more time, and then it'll culminate in one of these eclipse sessions. And you know, the eclipse sessions did tend, at least in my experience, really tended to enter a state of increased intensity. Like the energy of the field would often get a lot more intense, and it's really hard to articulate what would come up. There, there would be more of this quality that is at least moving in the direction of what Gebser describes as diaphaneity. It's like this open, like this open gathering is the best way I can put it. And sometimes there is a sense of like this flowering of grace. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to explain. Now, 
I, I want to ask this question. Is there a distinctly a perspectival expression of the imaginal realm? So what I'm going to do here is just put forward something that I, um, I put together after I started noticing something, which was this tendency sometimes for a certain image that would emerge during one session to re-emerge in a subsequent session later, um, usually in a context that was highly meaningful and resonant with that image. But it, it started happening more and more. And once I started noticing, I, noticing it, I just went back through the harvests of all the sessions because I, I usually write things down, I'll make doodles and everything. And I just tried to look at every time an image came back up again. Um, and I drew links between them, right? So this is gonna be almost a schematic and it's highly abstracted. It's totally ripped from context, right? Um, but this is like a schematic for all of the sessions. And I'm gonna just draw a link between two sessions anytime uh, a, a, an image came back forward and echoed. So you can see we have the solar, the lunar, solar, lunar, solar, lunar. We, the first one had an extra um, round. And then this was the first, eclipse session. Now watch this. The very first eclipse session, right, which has this more diaphanous quality, was the first one that had an echo of images. So it's like the, the one that reaches, in my experience, most strongly toward diaphany, we have the time dimension breaking through, right, the recalling of old images. Um, and I'm just going to let this kind of unfold, and you're going to see gradually the links will continue pr proliferating. Um, this is every time an image re-emerges in a subsequent session. It's being a little laggy here, so pardon me. But, and yeah, these links are just gonna keep adding up. And this is gonna be the last full um, cycle that's included. There we go. So that's where I stopped. Now you can see there's just this like highly entangled thing and that this represents time because every one of these celestial bodies is a different week. Um, so there's this like intertemporal hyperlinking where the same images were showing up at different times, right? So does imaginal perspectivity appear in rise iconic form? Um, this term rise icon would be taken from the Greek rhizoma which means root, and obviously the rhizome being most associated with Deleuze and Guattari's work, right? These decentralized, kind of hyperlinked processual dynamics. Um, and then the Greek icon or likeness and image. Um, so, rhizoconic process then would entail an entanglement of time and images whereby disparate moments are drawn into mutual resonance via common archetypal patterns. I jokingly wanted to say it's like a hyper object, Timothy Morton's term, of the imaginal realm. Right now, again, this that di diagram, that schematic is so it's so ripped out of context. You don't even know what the images are, right? N much less do you are you brought into the context in which the images are showing up, what it's like in these imaginal spaces. Um, Cheryl was kind enough. Cheryl's an, an excellent artist, and she's done some renditions of some of these imaginal spaces that we've explored together. Um, and she was kind enough to uh, let me um, present her images to you. This is an image from the very first lunar session that we ever did, right? And so you see there's, there's this like gate up on this precipice and all these people building all these fires up on this plateau and this waterfall that's going down into this um, pool of water that's full of bubbles. And like one of the bubbles holographically has the, the scene inside of it. And that's something that's come up a couple of times is this like holographic water bubble that seems to be saying something maybe about the structure of the imaginal. Um, Here's some of the other worlds. And I want to add that it's, there's almost a sense that like we really have, Cheryl and Cristiano and I have like gone to these places together. Um, and they're incredibly rich. And I, it's really impossible to convey everything of what it's like doing this. And Cheryl did her own harvesting, right? Um, and this is really cool because whereas what I was doing was drawing kind of temporal correspondences between the same images, Cheryl's 
drawing these again like the the Baudelaire poetic correspondences right she's looking at different images that come up at different times and finding where they cluster together in a kind of formal uh, coherence or a kind of formal correspondence um, and this is a whole other and this would have like diachronic and synchronic linkages between them um, so yeah there's there's just a lot of richness here that's kind of impossible to convey now, the way I want to close this off um, is, th is this question, right? Assuming what Gebser describes as um, a, a characteristic of the emerging integral consciousness, right? The supersession of the ego, what becomes of this idea of individuation, right? And again, here we have the sun, right? I've talked about what the sun is a symbol for a little bit, but it, it also would make sense to say that the sun symbolizes that urge of the cosmos itself to instantiate itself in like a, a highly differentiated um, nexus of experience and increasingly uh, expressed personality, right? That's like what every one of us is, is just the cosmos like trying to do that. And the imaginal seems to be like the kind of divine element of that process. Um, does individuation become a individuation? And again, this is from Gebser, right? A uh, is not from the, you know, it's not alpha negativium, it's, it's alpha privatium, which means it liberates, right? So this is not to negate individuation, it's to liberate individuation to re-embed itself in its context, right? In its ground. Um, now, Jung, even for Jung, individuation isn't about individualization, right? He, he frames individuation as a process that would actually free the individual to relate more wholly. Um, and yet it seems like something needs to be introduced when we consider this within Gebser's mutation of consciousness, right? So a individuation and the angelic community. Um, this is kind of a, maybe just a, a play on um, uh, Corban's idea of the angel out ahead, right? And that would be like the attractor of becoming. The angel out ahead is that attractor that draws us to become who we are. Um, I think in a individuation, it would, you know, kind of be, the figure ground relationship between the uniqueness of the individual sun, the individual star, which would be the individual person, and the sense that we're always in a process of, of co-creating, co-becoming, right? But our becoming is always embedded in our context, embedded in our relationships, and that creates a kind of constellation. There are constellations of people with a, with a pattern as well. Um, that the figure ground relationship between the individual and the community or the sun and the constellation is just held. It's in, neither are privileged, they're just both rendered to consciousness so that yes, we are becoming as individuals, but we're always becoming together. Um, and so, you know, this idea of like engaging in these collective imaginal practices, right? Who are these images rel relevant for? Because if, if we conceive of it in a more orthodox Jungian sense or even the way Corban would, would think of it, like Orthodox unions would probably think like, you know, you, when you're doing this practice, you're having people get together, drudge up, I don't, you know, draw forward um, uh, images of their own unconscious and then like stitching together a weird Frankenstein monster out of them. That's like this weird thing of people like putting their unconscious together. And I think, you know, Corban was very Lutheran in his understanding of individuation, that these theophanies are, are, are absolutely personal, right? It's, and it, it has to be absolutely personal. So he would, you know, think that like, this is a very confused thing to be doing. But I wanna, I wanna open up to the possibility that when, when we're sensing into the field in this way, somehow these images might be relevant to all involved, that, we, that they're not only speaking to our own becoming, maybe they're speaking to the process that we're in together in complex ways. And it just draws us into a more uh, fluidly intermingled way of being, right? And so we can see that even with the imaginal, this accords with like what Nora Bateson and um, I'd say Bio Akamalafe, you know, probably Timothy Morton, lots of people are pointing toward where there's this shift from the individual things to the fabric of relationship, the patterns that connect, the alive order, as Nora Bateson would say. So we see that happening with the images and the imaginal and the time and potentially for the, the people involved, right? That we're, we're moving into something more dynamic, more processual, more related. And so I just want to close here with Gebser. who says, nothing exists for its own sake. It exists for the sake of the whole. And I think that's a good way to draw it to a close here. Mm, thank you, Sam. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I have so much uh, to, 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 to say in, in, in reflection and response, but um, I want to open it up. Uh, we've got 
let's see, we've got about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll we'll have the next portion. So please, if uh, someone has some questions, let's dive in. I'm going to hold mine a little bit um, uh, and and let some folks uh, jump in before me. So um, yeah, let's let's have uh, Marianne. Um, be great to have you ask a question. Hi, everybody. Sam, that was really beautiful. And I, I just have a, a process clarification to ask of you. When the three of you get together, is whether it's a lunar or solar or corridor, does, is that, does that emerge out of uh, spontaneously? Or do you guys intend, let's do a lunar or let's do a solar? Yeah, I, I appreciate that question, Marianne. And, you know, I'm aware that Cheryl and Cristiano are here as well. And part of me wants to put them on the spot and invite them in to give their reflections as well. But I also want to leave that to be optional for them. But I have a lot to say in response to that. Um, that structure emerged along the process. It wasn't premeditated. It, If I'm really Gebzerian about it, you know, it was like in the not knowing what the hell we're doing, that that sort of came came forward maybe with the help of origin as insight. Like, okay, here's here's what this could be, and the insights dawning. And Cheryl and Christiana were so a part of this, you know, that um, yeah, it was it was such a relational process. Um, one thing that's interesting is that that structure is that's a mental system, right? That's the mental does that. Like this is this is how we're going to structure it. This is what we're going to do further on in the process, it just became clear sometimes that the integral just wants to erupt, like regardless of what the mental is trying to do to control it. One, I almost put this in the presentation, I didn't. Kind of toggling between the, where there's the solar, lunar, and, and the eclipse, and then where they're all eclipse sessions. Because when the integral erupts, you look back at the whole thing, you're like, it's it's been diabolous the whole time. Um, that This has been a mental construction. This is what the mental is trying to do, but the whole thing is transparent. So once the integral breaks through, that whole structure breaks down. It, it doesn't make sense anymore from that perspective. Um, so that, that would be my, my response to that. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Uh, let's get Kessia. It'd be great to have you on. Hi. That was wonderful. Uh, and what I can connect with your uh, process is the process of scoring. You know, score is basically this practice and technique where you you draw a space with an intention, time, and activities. And it's very important to understand that as a part. I think it's an integral part because it, it gives time and space so we can dive in to experience those other things that is a temporal. Without that, you know, chunk of time, space, and intention, we kind of like, our energy doesn't go there. We can do thousands of things. So it's interesting to understand as an integral uh, consciousness uh, to include the analytical consciousness as, you know, the drawing of space, just like a drawing of a theater or room. It requires the analytical a separation so we can go and experience right is that is that make sense yeah yeah definitely I mean what I'm hearing in that is that the the mental is distinctly um kind of suited to do that drawing to do that to do that mapping and in that way to kind of render that that temporal dimension present in a way that is hard to do without its participation. Um, that's the sense I was getting. I don't know if that that was kind of accurate to what you were attempting to convey. That's what I was hearing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that that's it. It's, so I, I see your process as a score, you know, as an analytical process of something that uh, you create time and space and intention to experience something that has no time mm -hmm. is a temporal right and it's very vast so it's a um, it, it's a stage it's a stage it's a space that you dedicate it's a sacred space that's also how ritual can be described you know you describe the ritual in time and space so that 
a temporal can be experienced, mm. right? Mm -hmm. We can draw that space mm -hmm. clearly. Mm -hmm. So we need both. We need the analytical to be integral mm -hmm. in, a, in a way to retrieve and remember. Yeah, and it's in some ways the that mapping process, which is necessary and is part of it, it, it also seems like it kind of becomes rendered ironic to itself, just in the sense that it, it becomes relativized, you know, and it's, it, 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 it uses its time form to elucidate something while recognizing that its time form is, is relative to something that is atemporal as well. So there's this, this ironic, beautifully ironic quality to it. Yeah, oh, nice. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Um, yeah, I was just going to say before we jump to, to Lisa, I, um, I, I felt uh, as, as you were showing the illustration and the graphic there and the interweaving, right, that kind of rhizomatic hyper object of the aesthetic universe kind of revealing itself, right, overdetermined with meaning and relationship. I, I was thinking of um, just the Christian mystics and their terminology for the dark intelligible abyss, right? Like the, their description of that unknowing or the Christian mystics describing the cloud of unknowing. And yet the mental rational and the mental structure is welcome there. It's it just, it's overdetermined by this transparency, right? The transparency is so, for those of us who've had contemplative insights or experiences, it's like the thought is almost drowned by that abyss like the thought could scream as loud and directive and totalizing as it can and it's still engulfed by unknowing right and so there's no risk there's no risk here to bring the mental in it's just in relationship so i really appreciated that image of the eclipse that was fantastic but um yeah thank you sam let me jump to uh uh to lisa mm, thank you sam and cheryl and all the collaborators, I there's so much to say, uh, so I won't go on and on, but I'll be tracking your work. I just want to say that what's what my attention keeps being pulled back to right now is, yeah, as has been already said, really, you're navigating such a careful um, path with your research here. And I really appreciate that you're staying on that edge of allowing and not, um, not rejecting, but yet taking, I think the, your point about the a individuation and how might we at least find enough language to bring that into the mental it's so needed it's so needed ways through and into and ways to invite others to embody the predicament differently so just big shout out appreciating you thank you thank you Thank you, Lisa. Danny, it would be great to have you jump in. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, uh, stay with Lisa, how, how Lisa was conveying this. What comes to me is contribution. This is a contribution. Um, I run into a lot of people, Just it was just a few days ago, and they were in a big conference and and they were having a practice of we space and they were put in various places and the report they gave was i don't know what we're supposed to be doing here and it was so genuine you know it's like they wanted you know their heart was there wanted but they didn't know what what this was about and so what you're offering here I just watched it, it's a bridge. It's a bridge and like you say, it's a map. It's some way for, I think it's very possible for many people, it's intuitive. It's just, it seems to have always been here with me, that sensing of the group space, but it isn't for most people. They don't know 
and I think your contribution, I hope it gets, I don't know what plans you have for it, but I think it really needs to come into the field to, um, it's a translation. You're translating something as a put and also transmuting, uh, transmitting it. You're transmitting and translating at the same time. So, thanks, Danny. And one thing that that's coming to mind um, as you were sharing that is that um, you know this is, I think, one of a huge variety of creative ways that these collective practices or these presencing practices and the imaginal can be brought together. Um, and woven together, um, and I, you know, sense that anyone who you know who plays around in these practices like to, you know, experiment um, and see what's possible. I do want to say that that there is a, an intensity, at least in my experience, also to the practices. Like, I guess the metaphor is like the, the moment you pull a tarot card, you know, it's like uh, once you once you look at that archetype and that archetype kind of coalesces around the situation. It's like oh, you're like now you're in it. Sometimes it's like you almost can't un undo that Pandora's box. Um, there sometimes is a way by kind of opening up to this dimension of things or this domain, like it's, it, it can be like that sometimes. And uh, there's an intensity to it. And you, at, at a certain point, it's like you're participating in it, you know, whether you want to or not. Um, and I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's important to, to open to that. Um, but there is that intensity to the, to the archetypal. And I, I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm still wrestling with like, what are the shadows maybe of this practice or what are the ways that we might get caught up in the kind of deficient forms of these structures and how do we show up for that? Um, I, think I'm, I, <laughs> I think I have a proclivity sometimes for getting latched on to the archetypal, sometimes in beneficial ways, maybe sometimes in challenging ways too. So that's, those are, uh, turbulent waters that I, I'm still trying to figure out personally, you know. Let me say one more thing and, and not about the shadow piece because uh, I'm, I'm, I've got a little point here. Someone once told me they, they converted to Judaism and the reason they converted was because of the rituals. And what they said is, I spent my whole life thinking rituals, and this goes back to what you were saying, Casey. It's Rituals, it's like, forget it, you know, they're not, there's nothing really happening there in that ritual, right? And that they, they began, what was their, uh, how can I say this? It's like the little key, you know, like you have a key for, for a code. It was, oh, the ritual is the subconscious. It is the place where the subconscious can be. And once they understood that, they were able to open up to the experience, to that intuitive experience, to that whatever. So I think what you're presenting is, has that key to the code. So I, I'm not saying you have to take the whole field over, but it's like, it's really a great contribution. Thank you, Danny. Danny. Uh, I wanted to invite uh, Aaron up to share a little bit. Let me just spotlight you, Aaron. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Hi, hi, Sam. Um, just want to firstly thank you for, you know, weaving those various threads together. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment um, when you were talking about Corbin and kind of where he pulled this term "active imagination." You know, um, it just reminded me because we know that Corbin was a a profound. Um, comparative theologian, especially of medieval metaphysics. And uh, in those traditions, we have the, the concept of the active intellect versus the passive intellect, you know, going back to Aristotle. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's kind of the, the paradigm that he's sort of, you know, pulling over into the imaginal realm, as it were. Um, but, you know, what, also what you get there, you know, this, that kind of metaphysics, which has arguably Egyptian roots, but certainly um, Platonic of, you know, the, the active intellect or the divine mind, which creates the forms, which then, um, which, which are the paradigms of the world of things as we know them. And, and the imaginal realm is this, is, is the mediating space that kind of helps clothe these things and images and 
color and births them into material being. And, um, you know, as Corbin said, or actually I think one of his Sufi alchemical sources said, you know, the imaginal realm is, uh, it's the place where um, spirits become bodies and bodies become spirits, you know, it's that. So, but um, what's also interesting with that whole dynamic is that, you know, it's, it's very solar and lunar. You get, you know, the active solar component and the, the, the receptive, the passive uh, lunar component, which, um, you know, you need something to receive the active intellect or active imagination uh, as much as you need something to, to give it. And I really like what you said about, we need to kind of take on that receptive function to receive the active, imagination you know we need to kind of just pull our our active our own active minds back and to create the space for for something else beyond us or deeper than us to come into being and you know this ties into a lot of stuff i've been working on with gabs for some years about the idea of what, what, what i call in, integral teleology it's this idea of um what, what you might call the will that cannot be willed or integral volition you know and you know, in his, in his later writings, Gibbs is quite explicit that um, you know, free will and predetermination are two sides of the same coin. You know, they're pulled, they're they're in a relationship like yin and yang. And we we overemphasize our rational free will and our you know conscious choices, all that. But on the other side is this um, more receptive function, which shapes our lives just as powerfully as, um, as our conscious choices, but there's this sort of deep destiny in our being, which is, you know, um, much more unconscious, and it, it's more connected to these um, entanglements and synchronous interweavings that, that you've articulated. So um, much more could be said, but yeah, I just wanted to make at least a few comments. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I appreciate that. And just to your first point, like that um, lineage that Corban's working within, you know, lends some uh, plausibility to the idea that he would have might have spontaneously um, translated um, that uh, concept of takayul to active imagination through his own kind of lineage he was drawing on and the way he was thinking about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, he, he was he was often translating, say, Sufi metaphysical terminology with their Latin equivalents in, you know, uh, medieval Christian mysticism. Like he was doing that a lot. So mm -hmm. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And just to the last point, I, I, I'm glad that you brought up this, um, I guess, the paradox of the will, you know, and it's mm. so clear that um, Western culture has been so one-sidedly on the, the Yang side, as you put it, um, and that there's a lot of running, you know, kind of rebalancing that needs to happen. And yet the, for me, the central challenge of, of Gebzer, like the kind of koan and all of it has to do with that paradox of the will, right? We have to know when to allow and when to act, when to receive and when to impart. Um, and that is a, that's a, a puzzle to live into constantly. It's, it's a yeah. challenging thing. And it comes up a lot. It's come up a lot for me in this practice, certainly, especially in the moments when things become more ambiguous and starting to, to lose the plot or things start decohering necessarily, you know, you need those moments of deco decohering, but, uh, mm -hmm. it's that, that's where that, that difficulty comes up and you really have to sit in that and, is it my will or thy will and trying to align right. my will with thy will as much as possible. But it's, it's hard to have a felt sense of that from the, the place where we're standing, I think. Yeah. And you know, this is why I come back to this, it gives this idea of primordial trust because, and again, in his, in his later writings, he's talking about, you know, we have to trust in that uncertainty and also in the invisible, you know, and these are things that we, we can't, like our, our rational minds, you know, we like to, we, we place trust in what is tangible, visible, logical, clear, you know, and he's saying primordial trust is, is the opposite. You have to place your trust in the unknown and the intangible, you know, that um, everything we don't know. 
And um, yeah, that's that, that's that Galassenheit, that letting, letting be and letting through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, Aaron. Thank you. Mm. And then, yeah, thank you, Aaron. Uh, so much to say about that, but uh, I'm going to hold off again till uh, we move to the unthinkable present uh, section, although I feel like we're kind of approaching it. Um, let me go to Adam and then Jesse. I think you don't have your hand raised, but you did before, so you're welcome to jump back in if you like, but yeah, Adam. And Sam, thank you for your presentation. It was utterly brilliant, like I said, and um, I know a lot of the, a lot of your thinking follows my line of thinking. I know we've had a several uh, side conversations about it, but I didn't know that you had such a vibrant and rich practice already, like, you know, already mapped out. And so like, there were so many resonances with, with, with the things you were saying. I followed along brilliantly because again, I have, I've been following on the same lines. I've, you know, studied Rhea Bach, I've, I've read her book um, and I've taken, you know, a lot of Otto Sharmer's uh, conversations and courses with uh, ULAB and all that. So. Um, so a lot of a lot of what you said was was very um, just just very resonant with me. Um, Gebser, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, talks about super individuation, right? And it's this idea of like a group, like uh, autonomous beings that that uh, dynamically subordinate to a larger, you know, wholeness, right? So um, I know uh, Jamie Wheel's work deals a lot with, when he was talking about collective intelligence, and there's some really cool videos on Rebel Wisdom about that. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was that, did you, did you, in, in any of your sessions, did you ever present a problem like in a crucible and, and use that process to try to solve that problem? Um, is that something that, that your program is designed to do? Or That's a really good question, Adam. Um, and you brought us right back to the question of, you know, the will and what, um, what role does that have at this point? No. Um, at this point in the practice, it's mostly been just an opening to the process, but this is not something that hasn't come up. And, um, you know, I've thought about the, the tradition of dream in incubation as like a possibility, um, you know, like going to the island of coast to the Asclepion with a problem or with an ailment, bringing it to the uh, Apollonic priest there, and then going into the temple to dream and receive a dream in response to the ailment, right? That could there be a process of incubation brought up where similarly to collective presencing, where the, the hosts source a question and then open it up to the field and that becomes the guiding thing. It, could there be something sourced with a, a intention to incubate and bring that into the process? It seems possible to me. Um, or it would be something probably worth experimenting with at some point hasn't happened yet, but um, that's, that's a possibility. And I think it's an important question. And there's a part of me that's really has, you know, that almost shies away from introducing will, you know, into this, like what feels like very sacred territory with the imaginal, but I think there may be too much shyness potentially there. Um, so that, that is, you know, something that that's been present and, at least has certainly been on my mind as a possibility. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great question, Adam. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick note on that before we jump to, to Jesse, that uh, there's an implicit agency in, in the work that you're doing, right? There's an implicit creative agency in being able to um, weave these connections, that they are personal and meaningful connections, right? Not only to see the patterns, to see that kind of imaginal rhizomatic hyper object, but also there's that sense that transparency is already innately there because those connections are rendered transparent, crystallized, popping up like little mushrooms across space and time, and you're involved in it, right? So there's this intensification I don't know if will is good is a good word, but it's like this participation, this creative agentic participation, which to me sounds something like this as you're speaking, this trans individuation, right? This planetary trans individuation that um, um, Debashish Banerjee talks about with Simon Don and Aurobindo as well, right? This, this kind of plasticity and creative process. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's a question, but I'm sensing agency and creativity being really critical here. And, and Gebser says, right, in, in the ever-present origin, in creativity, origin is present. So what happens when we 
become co-present with this creative process as agents of it. Mm -hmm. um, explosion of different thoughts and possibilities show up there. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that, Jeremy. One thing that's just coming up in response to that, and it's pinging off what Aaron brought up earlier, I guess, is this notion of primal trust, right? To trust the the soup, to trust the mass of confusa and get comfortable in that. But, and this is probably the biggest edge, at least for me personally, is that primal trust means trusting ourselves too, you know? But then it means trusting ourselves in an age where we need to get beyond our very egocentric, overly agential attitude, right? This very unrelated um, kind of way of being. And that is, you know, that's so strange. That's that's a paradox in itself, right? Like we got to trust ourselves. We got to trust ourselves um, in, <laughs> in the possibility that now trusting ourselves anew will participate in a more healthy fashion. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's wrought with, with, with paradox, I suppose, but yeah. I like so that. Just to add to that idea, this trusting ourselves, yes, absolutely. But also we are far deeper and more whole than we, we give ourselves credit for. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so when we trust ourselves, yes, we trust our, our known selves. We've got to trust the, the you know, we're, we're the tip of an iceberg and there's much, much more depth there. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's super personal, innate, right? That, that they have to speak. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse, please. Um. Um, yeah, thank you. I um, had the same question that Adam had as to whether or not you'd ever thrown an intention or, you know, as in a, a goal or a problem in, into the mix. And um, I, you know, I, I kind of had this vision of here we have these world leaders, right? And they're, they're grappling with something having to do with planetary change or planetary need. And, and then like going off to a session and doing, doing this work that you're proposing and then seeing if the problem is still even a problem or how it might be resolved. Um, but the other, the other piece of that too, which I, is a question to you in your process of doing this with your two teammates, fellow, or ex fellow explorers, I'm wondering if the relational field with the three of you changed, um, you know, like sitting with two other people and on a weekly basis going in and doing this very deeply intensive work and rendering of the imaginal together. I mean, was, did, did you, you know, I, and maybe it's too personal to ask, but, you know, was there a, a shift in the connection with the three of you? Um, you know, with the idea that your process, maybe it, you know, maybe it solves at a mental level, but maybe it's just a way of opening connections with people and with, with others to actualize the, you know, individuation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a wonderful question, Jesse. And there are multiple, um, multiple responses to that, that come up. And I think the first thing, um, that I would just emphasize is that one way that it um, worked on the relationship to both Cheryl and Cristiano, at least for me, who are here is like a lot of love and a lot of affinity opened up. Like there's, um, there's such an intimacy um, in doing this work together. And, you know, I just, I still like, they're, they're both here and I feel so self-conscious because like, this is such a, um, emergent process between the three of us, you know, that uh, I just, yeah, I want to shine like a lot of, of light and love on both of them and a lot of gratitude because it's just, it, it is what it is because of them. Um, and so there is that affinity and, you know, there are, there are ways that, um, that um, and I'll leave it maybe somewhat um, <laughs> on the abstract level, you know, but I do, you know, think that sometimes maybe what comes through the imaginal can sometimes have that quality of the anticipatory dream or can be like a, um, it can have an anticipatory quality to the deeper sides of relational process that might unfold through time. Um, you know, and, and I think that, that that is this way that these images, these archetypal patterns sometimes have, have the space between us in them, have our mutual process in them, you know, and we're navigating these archetypes and trying to do so skillfully together, um, you know, and I, it's that, um, well, yeah, I just say Rilke has been helpful um, for me with that, with his poetry of just kind of elucidating um, the, 
uh, the intensity of participating in the archetypal patterns, you know, because uh, it, it can be intense and, and there's a, I, I guess there's a skill that's needed. And actually what's coming up now, and I just want to emphasize this, is that Rob Berbea's work on the soul-making dharma, uh, if anyone is familiar with that, I so recommend checking it out. He's left such a beautiful gift, um, kind of bringing uh, the Buddhist tradition, particularly with an emphasis on empty, emptiness and, and unfabricating or the unfabricated, into such a dynamic relationship with the imaginal traditions, um, not only like running through through the West and their their deeper uh, origins, as a way of like skillfully fabricating, as a skillful mode of participation of the architectural forms, and a way to to practice that. Um, and yeah, I think that what he's gesturing towards is a, is also a way to um, help us practice and being skillful in this ar archetypal participation that we're always wound up in, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, so that would be a kind of multifaceted response to that. Thank you, great, it's with beautiful work, beautiful work, all three thank of you. you. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Jesse. Uh, we've just got a few more and then maybe we'll take another fiver and then just open it up to this unthinkable present that we're already uh, lolling about in and exploring here, but um, Oh, Judith, a uh, quick question, Sam. Uh, can you repeat the name of, of the person you just referred to, you just mentioned? Rob Barbea, right? Yeah, I'll type it in the chat real quick. And, you know, there was a, a website. Um, he, I, I was almost said he struggled with um, pancreatic cancer, but listening to him, it's like he wasn't even really struggling with it. He was just beautifully with it. Um, it but it was in his process of, of having this pancreatic cancer diagnosis, not knowing how long he was going to live, that this soul-making dharma came through him and he just transmitted it like through that whole process so beautifully. And there's a, a website, and I'll post that in the chat as well, that has like all of the extant recordings of his transmission um, just available for everybody. And it's, it's just a gorgeous um, offering, um, just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I've lightly touched on Rob Berbea's work uh, through through Daniel Thorson, who first um, recommended him to me after our interview on his podcast. And uh, yes, I've, I've really found it a very interesting place that I admittedly need to lean into a little bit more. But um, just uh, one or two quick ones. Uh, Lisa's asking, I don't know if this is a quick one, but it's a quick, it's a short question. Sam, how do you relate to Zach Stein's distinctions between archetype and image? Uh, love it, because you know, the relationship between Hillman and Jung has always been an uncomfortable one for me. And I bounce back and forth between being very frustrated with one of the one or the other of them, um, where, you know, Hillman is such a gadfly um, for Jung, you know, and, and yet I feel like Jung continues to re reassert himself, even uh, when I start getting kind of Hillmanian. And it's, it feels like the, the tension between the many and the one in a certain way. But Zach Stein's metapsychology in essentially, I would say he, he, he situates Hillman and this emphasis on sticking with the image and the multiplicity and the particularity and this idea of ensoulment and then situates Jung in this, this idea of transcendence. It's the, it's the, it's the, the symbolic, right? It's the um, kind of extraction of the universal from the particular and the tension between these, like what Edgar Moran uh, talks about as unitas multiplex, right? So that's kind of like this tension, like this unity and multiplicity that's always in tension and then development, right? It's actually the tension between these that keep the cycle of development moving. So I just think it's brilliant. I was like, oh, thank you. When I saw him uh, relate those in that way, it's like, here's a, here's a model that can kind of help me be more comfortable in my discomfort with how to like figure out what's going on between Jung and Hillman. Cause it's, 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 it's a good tension and it's bothersome. Um, so that, that would be like my quick, uh, quick answer to that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sam. All right. Well, uh, let's, let's formally close this portion before we move to the unthinkable present and give us about five for another quick bio break, quick snack break. And everyone is welcome to stick around and, and continue the conversation after. It's going to be very, very loose and open and uh, not too much structure. Um, really just... We'll be here to reflect on the conference and uh, maybe I can talk a little bit about what we have in mind for next year as well and how to get, get involved and continue to stay involved uh, between then and now. So, uh, all right, everybody, thank you so much and see you in five. We're going to leave the room open till then. <laughs>